In these next few chapters, we're going to look at characterization methods, basically analytical chemistry methods to take a sample of chemicals and determine what's in them. In this chapter, we're going to look at IR spectroscopy and mass spectrometry. Spectroscopy involves shining light on a sample and seeing how the light interacts with that sample. All right, so usually you have a detector uh, that looks for changes in the light that you're shining on your material. All right, now when I say light, I'm not talking about just solely visible light, uh, though we will eventually look at UV vis spectroscopy that does use visible light, along with obviously UV light. Uh, but I'm talking about electromagnetic radiation in general. All right, so we're talking about the whole spectrum uh, of electromagnetic radiation. I'll refer to that as light, okay, not just visible light. So when we look at light, remember, uh, you, can, you have light that travels either as particles, or photons, or we could describe it as traveling in waves, right? And these are all legitimate ways to think of electromagnetic radiation, all right? Whether as, uh, you know, basically they have an energy, they have a wavelength, uh, they have a frequency, these are different uh, sort of characteristics of light that you want to look at uh, when you are describing the different parts of that electromagnetic radiation spectrum. Okay, uh, so just uh, this hopefully should be a little bit of a refresher from physics if you've already taken a physics course uh, or if you haven't hopefully this um, you know I'll try and stick to the basics and uh, if you do eventually go on to take a physics course you will you know hopefully recognize this. Uh, but basically when you look at uh, light being described as a wave you could describe the length of the wave so um, basically you could uh, you know well, there we go so if you have a you know imagine you have an x and y axis here and you think of a wave as looking something like this uh, you know, this actually would go on and continue repeating, of course. Um, if I take a point, like let's say from one crest to another crest, uh, that distance is a wavelength. All right. Now you, you could measure it at a different points. So a lot of people might uh, you take this point and see that point come back again over here. That's the same distance. But that is a wavelength, which you'll see sometimes represented with the Greek letter lambda. Okay. Um, the frequency is the number of waves that fit into a given unit of time. And we represent that with the Greek letter nu. Okay. Uh, it looks a little bit like a V. I think if you're drawing a, the Greek letter nu by hand, it tends to look like this. Um, and in the case of both wavelength and frequency, we can tie those to the energy of the radiation uh, using these corresponding formulas. So uh, frequency is directly proportional to energy. Uh, they are linked together by Planck's constant, represented with the letter H. Um, and energy is also equal to H times C, which is the speed of light, divided by lambda, which is the wavelength. So in other words, uh, wavelength is inversely proportional to energy, Okay, just as it's uh, you know, your frequency is also equal to C over lambda. Okay, so in other words, your wavelength is also um, inversely proportional to your frequency. So, in other words, the shorter the wavelength, the higher the energy, uh, the higher the frequency of the light. Okay, so here is our electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, we have, uh, you know, our lower energy or longer wavelengths uh, going all the way down to radio waves, uh, including microwaves. All right, so microwaves are actually a little bit on the, the shorter wavelengths of radio waves. Uh, then we have infrared radiation, all right, and we have visible light over here, which of course has all the colors of the rainbow. Uh, so infrared, uh, the word infra means less than or lower than. Uh, so infrared light is lower energy than the red part of our visible spectrum. Okay. Now, of course, we go through the colors of the rainbow. And at the higher energy or shorter wavelength end, we have the violet end. So when we get past that, we have ultraviolet. Okay. So ultraviolet means more than violet or higher energy than violet. And if we go past that, then we get to x-rays and gamma rays. And of course, uh, those are the 
higher energy forms of the electromagnetic spectrum. So gamma rays are uh, the highest energy types of light out there. They have very short wavelengths, very high frequencies, high energy. So basically, when it comes to spectroscopy, we're going to take different parts of this spectrum and shine that kind of light on our sample and see what happens. All right, so uh, in the next chapter, we're going to look at NMR spectroscopy. Uh, so there we will take radio waves and fire radio wave pulses at our sample and see the effect on that. Um, there's also a magnetic field involved with that, hence the, the M in uh, nuclear magnetic resonance. In this chapter, we're going to look at IR spectroscopy. And so here we're going to use the infrared uh, part of that spectrum. Okay, uh, in two chapters, we'll look at UV vis spectroscopy, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, and of course, the UV, of course, there stands for ultraviolet, and the vis part of that is visible spectrum. Now, each of these tell us different things. Okay, uh, and we'll go into more detail on NMR in the next. Uh, in the next chapter, but uh, basically NMR spectroscopy uh, will tell us kind of the environments the different atoms are in, and that tells us a little bit of how they're connected to each other. All right, uh, you'll see that NMR is uh, arguably the most useful analytical technique for organic chemists. Uh, uh, once we get past the next chapter, we're going to be using NMR spectroscopy quite a bit. IR spectroscopy is very useful for identifying functional groups. You've already seen some IR uh, just through lab last semester, and you've probably noticed that uh, we can quickly identify the presence of something like an alcohol group or carboxylic acid uh, just by seeing the relevant peak in our IR spectrum. Okay, and we'll go into more detail uh, into how to read an IR uh, graph uh, or spectrum in this chapter. All right, uh, UV vis spectroscopy. Uh, we'll get into more detail on that in a couple of chapters. But uh, in a nutshell, we're going to look at conjugated pi systems using those. So, in other words, uh, systems that involve alternating double and single bonds. Earlier, I mentioned that spectroscopy involves interaction between matter and light. You shine light on your material, and you have a detector picking up uh, how that light has changed. Now. This interaction happens because matter behaves, uh, it exhibits quantum behavior once you get down to the molecular level. So uh, when you shine light of a particular energy that corresponds to or is in resonance with a particular state of the matter, so, so a particular vibrational or rotational state, um, that's what the detector is picking up. Right, you, you find like that wavelength of light, that energy of light missing usually. Right, so in the case of IR spectroscopy, uh, this typically has to do with actual vibration of bonds, uh, and we'll go into more detail on that. Uh, and we'll see that uh, there are other forms of these quantum states that uh, you know we vary depending on the light that we're using and the type of spectroscopy we're using. Okay, so we'll go into more detail with this in the other, uh, basically in the different kinds of spectroscopy we'll look at in these next few chapters. All right, so um, yeah, so basically IR light happens to be in the particular energy range that corresponds to these uh, vibration of bonds. Uh, so your bonds uh, absorb uh, these photons of light or these wavelengths of light, uh, and if it corresponds to the energy of that vibration, uh, your detector notices that difference in light, that that wavelength of light is being absorbed. Okay, so what kind of quantum states are we talking about when we talk about these uh, vibrations? You can look at the sort of back and forth vibration or stretching vibration between two atoms connected by a covalent bond. Uh, you could look at the uh, interaction between uh, two atoms as they sort of bend towards each other. Okay, so kind of like uh, this interaction here, uh, what we call scissoring, you can imagine that these two bonds um, are sort of moving closer and further apart. Okay, uh, then we could also have a twisting motion, right? So if you have some sort of central axis and uh, these two atoms move clockwise or counterclockwise around it, okay? Uh, all of these are associated with some 
uh, energy and the energy will correspond to a wavelength of light that's in that infrared range of your electromagnetic spectrum. Infrared imaging or thermal imaging works on the same principle actually. So uh, if you're familiar with night vision goggles, uh, they work through uh, not visible light, uh, but infrared radiation coming off uh, something. So even uh, if you don't have a lot of visible light present, uh, night vision goggles can detect uh, heat essentially uh, rising off images and you kind of get an image of things that are present that way. So infrared spectroscopy works in a similar principle in that it's looking for this light, uh, that, or at least the detector picks up light that's making its way uh, through the sample. All right. Now, the only difference there is, of course, uh, you're shining the infrared infrared light on your sample, and your kind of your detector is picking up what's making its way through the sample. Now, where does why do we have different wavelengths of infrared light that get picked up? Uh, the reason for this is that the energy gaps between these different vibrational states or these different quantum states is different. All right. So, if you have a larger gap in uh, between these states um, that corresponds to a shorter wavelength of uh, of light that you know that would get absorbed to cause that uh, you know that difference in state to get, cause that change in state. Okay. So so essentially, all you're doing is you have uh, in your infrared spectrometer, uh, you have your sample that you usually have loaded either onto. Um, a salt plate or mixed in with a potassium bromide uh, pellet and you put it into a certain holder and the device, uh, the, the instrument shines infrared light through your sample, okay, either the plate or the pellet that you're using. And of course you have a detector on the other side that then uh, sees what light makes its way to, well, through the sample to the detector. Okay, now the device, of course, then uh, shines a different, uh, you know, a whole range of different frequencies of infrared light, um, and the detector notices how the intensity of the light changes uh, as you change the frequency of light. All right. Oh, a quick note here about why we use a salt plate. All right. So either sodium chloride for, in the case of liquid samples, um, you might remember we we used that back last semester uh, when we did our lab with eugenol. I took your samples of eugenol, put a couple of drops on a flat salt plate, uh, and that uh, went into a little metal holder that I slid into our IR uh, spectro spectrometer, um, and. Uh, if we had a solid sample, we would use potassium bromide. Uh, basically, you mix it in uh, with the potassium bromide, you grind it together, and then you put it into a press, which you just compress into a little pellet. Okay, and that goes into a similar metal holder, right? Um, the reason for this is that uh, these ionic compounds uh, don't interact with infrared light. Um, they would interact with uh, with electromagnetic radiation, but just not in that infrared region. All right, so it's actually a good material to hold the substance that we are examining because we know that the infrared light will only interact with the material that's embedded into our salt. Okay, so what does an infrared uh, spectrum look like? Uh, you guys, again, would have seen one in lab last semester, but uh, basically it looks like this, right? On our x-axis, we have what are called wave numbers, which are essentially uh, kind of a, a uh, derivative of frequency, all right? They're kind of like an inverse of your wavelength, basically. And on the um, on the y-axis, we have percent transmittance, in other words, how much uh, infrared light of that particular wave number makes it to the detector. All right, so wherever you see these sort of peaks with these sort of downward pointing peaks, uh, you know that your sample has absorbed uh, that infrared light. Okay, so what uh, I mentioned that wavelength numbers are tied into 
uh, to wavelength and frequency, uh, this is the actual calculation. So to calculate a wave number, you take the uh, frequency and you divide it by the speed of light. Uh, so if you're trying to figure out how the units work there, uh, remember frequency is uh, the number of waves per unit time. So usually it's given in inverse seconds uh, or hertz, okay, which are the same thing. Uh, speed of light is uh, meters per second, right? And so, uh, or at least some unit of distance per second. Um, so if you take your per time and divide by, you know, a distance per time, you get uh, inverse distance. So in this case, uh, using centimeters, uh, that's the scale we're going to use, or inverse centimeters rather. Okay. Oh, uh, this question is kind of important. So, how do wave numbers? How are wave numbers in energy related? Uh, so, basically, the uh, shorter the wave number. So, if if we go back to this calculation, notice that frequency and wave number are directly proportional. Well, remember, frequency and energy are also directly proportional, right? So, uh, in other words, wave numbers increase as the energy increases. All right. So, as we go to the left of our diagram. Um, the energy of light is increasing. All right, so as we have higher wave numbers here on the left, uh, the energy um, of our light is also increasing. Okay, so how do we read an IR spectrum? When we look at this graph, we want to look at the different peaks that are present, and we want to examine them for three main characteristics. We look at the wave number, so where on this x-axis is our peak showing up. We look at the intensity, in other words, how deep are these peaks? All right, so notice that we have, for example, very strong peaks over here versus very uh, weak peaks over here. Um, and then, of course, we want to look at the shape of the peaks. Are they very sharp peaks or are they kind of rounded like this, very broad peaks? So let's look at each of these in turn. For a wave number, uh, we tie this in to the bond strength and the mass of the atoms that we're looking at. Okay, that's that's kind of what determines the wave number for the peak that we're looking at. All right, so if, uh, if you want to see the actual formula behind it uh, that's described here, uh, the bond strength is directly proportional to our wave number. So generally, the stronger the bond, the higher the wave number there. Okay, the Reduced mass over here is on the denominator. So reduced mass is inversely proportional to our wave number. Now, what is the reduced mass? Well, if we're looking at a bond between two atoms, the reduced mass is the, uh, is the product of those two atoms' masses divided by the sum of their two masses. All right. So, so generally speaking, reduced mass is directly proportional to well, the mass of your atoms. And we can see that that then in turn is inversely proportional to our wave numbers. So in other words, the heavier your atoms, the lower your wave number. Okay, so something to keep in mind there when uh, in a nutshell you want to determine or you're comparing different types of stretches and you're trying to figure out where will these wave numbers show up? Where will these peaks show up at with what wave numbers? Okay, so let's see some examples here, and you can kind of see this in practice. All right, so let's look at a few um, bonds between carbon and other atoms. So as we go through each of these examples, all right, so we've got carbon connected to a hydrogen, to a deuterium, which remember is just a, an isotope of hydrogen with an extra neutron, so it's a hydrogen two. Uh, oxygen and chlorine, you, you see that we are increasing the mass of our atoms connected to carbon. Okay, so this would increase the, our reduced mass. Well, remember, our reduced mass is inversely proportional to our, uh, to our wave number, right? It's, uh, it's on the denominator here. So as our mass increases, and therefore our reduced mass also increases, our wave number is going to decrease. And you can see that by the decreasing wave numbers for each of these bonds. Now, let's pick two atoms and change the strength of the bond between them. So uh, if we go from a triple bond between carbon and nitrogen to a double bond to a single bond, uh, remember the only difference between these, okay, all three of these bonds have a sigma bond between our carbon and nitrogen, 
the only difference is that we have extra pi bonds um, as we go to a double or triple bond. So our triple bond here is going to be the strongest, right? It's got a sigma bond and two pi bonds. And our, our single bond, which is only a sigma bond, is our weakest. Notice that the wave number is larger for our stronger bond and it's lower for our weaker bond. Okay, so again, you can see how the uh, our bond strength is directly proportional to our wave number. So, with that in mind, where do we see particular bonds? Okay, this is uh, very important when you are looking at your spectrum and you see peaks in certain ranges, uh, and you want to know what they correspond to. Okay, so the general rule of thumb is, um, as you you know, if, if you look towards the left of your spectrum, so from 2700 wave numbers upwards, you're generally looking at things bonded to hydrogen. Okay, now in the 21 to 2300 range, you're looking at triple bonds. In the 1600 to 1850 range, you're looking at double bonds. Um, and then below that, you're looking at single bonds that are not connected to a hydrogen. Okay, so uh, this range over here tends to be a bit of a mess. Um, we'll, we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, but So you'll find that these types of peaks, these uh, ranges here, are what really help us see various functional groups. So we call that region the diagnostic region. So that's really what's going to show us the type of functional groups we're looking for. Uh, the region over here with the single bonds is what we call the fingerprint region. So um, you have this sort of um, indistinct uh, sort of mixture of all these bonds. And like I said, there's lots of them and usually a mess of them. Uh, but that being said, if you do have a sample to compare it to, uh, it hopefully should line up kind of like matching fingerprints, hence the name. All right. So let's have a look at our diagnostic and fingerprints for this, uh, for an example spectrum. So here we have uh, two butanol, all right, and this is a spectrum for that molecule. Uh, and you can kind of see that uh, that distinction uh, between our fingerprint region, which like I said, is a whole mess of peaks here. But uh, if we look at the diagnostic region, again, there are a few clear peaks that give us an insight into what functional groups we have present. All right, so uh, you can see here that we have, especially this nice broad peak here is uh, kind of characteristic of alcohol groups. Uh, and that kind of uh, is, you know, is very easy to pick up here in this diagnostic region. Okay, here is 2-propanol, right? A very similar molecule, and again, you can see that that functional group, uh, that alcohol group, uh, showing up pretty clearly in that diagnostic region over here. Okay, so if we were to compare the two, all right, notice that uh, if we, we if we were trying to line up. Uh, if, are these two spectrum of the same molecule? You could look at that uh, di that fingerprint region and see that you know these do not uh, all correspond to the same peaks, right? Uh, but more importantly, I think uh, if we look at the diagnostic region, uh, seeing that you know this broad peak over here, we know that we're dealing with alcohol groups. Okay, so um, in when we look at the uh, strength of a uh, of, of two bonds, right? Remember, they are that bond strength is directly proportional to our wave numbers, right? So let's say we compared a carbon hydrogen stretch with uh, with an oxygen hydrogen stretch. Okay, uh, if we look at the wave numbers for those two, okay, we have uh, lower wave numbers for the carbon hydrogen stretch. Okay, so actually, if we go back to this, you can see. Uh, looking at these bonds, I, I kind of already gave this away by mentioning that this broad peak over here is an um, is an alcohol group, and we'll see why later on. Uh, you know, why does it take that broad nature when we look at the shapes of peaks? But but for now, uh, just looking at the wave numbers, you could also figure out that that is our oxygen hydrogen stretch uh, because we know that in this far downfield, right, at these higher wave numbers. These uh, these peaks have to come from bonds with hydrogen, right? That if we if we go back to our little um, uh, sort of uh, template here, we can see that that region is with bonds to hydrogen. So we know that these have to be either oxygen hydrogen or carbon hydrogen bonds, right? 
Well, if we look at um, bond strength, and we know that oxygen hydrogen bonds are stronger than carbon hydrogen bonds, uh, that alone will tell you that this peak down here is from the oxygen hydrogen. Okay, so, so that peak that's a little bit further down uh, must come from that OH bond, okay, because those bonds are stronger and therefore have a higher wave number. Okay. So let's have a look at some other different uh, you know, stretches for our particular bond. So now let's compare three types of carbon-hydrogen single bonds. Notice that the hybridization of the carbon affects the wave number. So here we have an sp3 carbon, all right, and that CH bond shows up at a 2900 uh, wave numbers around that range. Uh, with an sp2 carbon, uh, we see that that peak shifts further up. We have a higher wave number. And with an sp hybridized carbon, it's even higher to about 3300. Okay, so since our wave numbers are dependent on the strength of bonds and the masses involved, well, we know this is not due to the reduced mass because we have the same atoms involved here, right? So it has to come from the bond strength. The hybridization of that carbon uh, and the way that orbital overlaps with the hydrogen uh, changes the strength of the bond. Okay, uh, it, and it probably makes a little bit more sense when you think about the size of the orbitals involved, right? So if you have an sp hybrid orbital, uh, those orbitals are smaller, right? Because they've got more s character, and therefore you're going to have more overlap with the s orbital of your hydrogen atom, and that is why then your um, your wave number is going to be higher. Okay, so with that in mind, that itself will also give us a useful piece of information when we're looking at uh, the wave numbers of certain bonds. We can use that 3000 number there as kind of a little, uh, you know, it's just a, sort of a divider or a border uh, or benchmark, I guess. Um, and we know that if we have an sp3 hybridized carbon, in other words, an alkane, uh, that those peaks with well, those carbon hydrogen bonds will show up at a wave number lower than 3000. But for alkenes and alkynes, okay, where we have a CH bond that's attached to an sp2 or sp hybridized carbon, those are going to show up above 3000. Okay, so, so that's something that helps distinguish those types of bonds. Okay, uh, a little quick note here about those, of course. Uh, please note that this is not the carbon itself that does that, but a carbon attached to a hydrogen. So uh, you do need a hydrogen attached to that carbon. So for example, if you are if you have a terminal alkyne, yeah, you can figure that out. But if your alkyne is an internal alkyne, where there are no hydrogens attached to those carbons, you're not going to see this peak here. Okay, so watch out for that, okay? So, here are some examples of uh, different, uh, you know, alkenes and alkynes. Uh, let's see if we would have any peaks that would be above 3,000 wave numbers. Okay, so feel free to pause this video while you think about this. Okay, so if you're back now, uh, let's go through each of these examples in turn. So over here we have uh, an alkene. Now again, remember, we need a hydrogen attached to one of these sp2 carbons. And what's not shown here is this carbon-hydrogen bond. So this would actually show up somewhere above 3,000 wave numbers. Um, over here, now this uh, alkene doesn't have any hydrogens attached to those sp2 carbons. So we won't see uh, those CH bonds uh, beyond 3,000. The only other CH bonds here are belong to sp three hybridized carbons and they would show up below 3000 wave numbers. Okay, uh, though of course uh, if you do want to look for a peak that is above 3000 wave numbers you'll of course see this OH bond. Okay, that'll be a broad peak further downfield at those higher wave numbers as we saw earlier. And then if we look at this example here there will be no peaks uh, beyond 3000. So those were here we have an sp hybridized carbon and sp hybridized carbon, but since this alkyne is internal, there are no hydrogens attached to those sp carbons and therefore those will not show up in that range for carbon hydrogen bonds. Uh, likewise for this um, alkene over here, this is a uh, tetra substitute alkene, there are only carbons attached to those sp3 
uh, sorry, sp2 hybridized carbons, and therefore you won't see a CH stretch from those sp2 hybridized carbons. So where are all the CH stretches? They're all on these methyl groups, right? So we have these, uh, the CH3 over here, a CH3 over here, a CH3 over here, and here. Um, and so all of those will show up below uh, 3,000 wave numbers. Okay, so we will not see anything above 3,000 for that. All right, what else affects wave number? Uh, well, resonance can affect your wave number because now you can have a bond that has partial, single, and double bond character. Um, carbonyls are great examples of this because uh, you know we have a very common resonance structure for a carbonyl that has a single bond, right? So if these pi electrons go up to that electronegative oxygen, all right, notice that we now have that carbon oxygen bond having some single bond character. Okay, so so keep in mind that that uh, you know causes your uh, your bond to shift accordingly, right? Remember, your double bond is a stronger bond than a single bond, and therefore this would show up at a higher wave number, and this would be at a lower wave number. So the more stable this resonance structure is, the lower your wave number for that carbonyl, okay? Uh, so if a carbonyl normally shows up at about 17, 20 wave numbers, and you get a peak that is at a number lower than that, well, that tells you that you have a resonance structure that stabilizes, that, that gets stabilized with this partial single bond character. Uh, let me show you some examples so you can see what I'm talking about. So here we have a conjugated ketone, right? So here we have um, a double bond where we can have these electrons get pushed around not just between these two atoms, but all the way to these atoms. So if I were to draw an electron pushing diagram here, um, if I have these electrons move up here, all right, and I have some partial bond character here, uh, sorry, a partial positive charge here, um, I could also have these electrons move over here, okay? Um, and that would give us a resonance structure that looks like this. Okay, so we have our partial positive charge over here and our partial negative charge over here. All right, um, so again, my point here is that, uh, you, and of course you have like the resonance structures in between this, but my, my point is that we've got multiple resonance structures that have the single bond character here. Okay, um, and you know, and this is obviously more stabilized then because you've got that, those charges spread out over more atoms. Okay, so instead of showing up at a wave number of 1720, it shows up at the lower 1680 because it has more single bond character. Okay, um, over here we have an uh, you know an ester. All right, so we have this alkoxy group over here. Uh, remember, oxygen is pretty electronegative, so uh, instead of these electrons being sucked up by this carbonyl oxygen, uh, this oxygen over here is also pulling some of that electron density this way. All right, and so uh, that kind of destabilizes that single bond resonance structure, uh, and that's, in other words, keeping this more in that double bond character. All right, so that's why we have a higher wave number here because uh, this um, the the single bond resonance structure is destabilized. Okay, um, and of course here you can see kind of a compromise between the two. Right, you have that uh, alkoxy group that's pulling the electron density away, but you also have a uh, a uh, conjugated pi bond that helps um, you know contribute to that single bond character, All right? So so notice that uh, we have a a wave number that's kind of in between these two options. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the intensity of the signals, right? So uh, I pointed out that you could have very strong signals that uh, you know absorb a lot of your IR radiation, right? And so they show up as a very deep peak, uh, or you could have weak signals that are very shallow peaks, okay, they, they don't have as much, uh, you know, they don't absorb as much of that infrared radiation. So what causes that? Well, again, now to think of this, you've got to go back to how the waves themselves work, right? Uh, so if you if you picture your bond as kind of, uh, you know, as oscillating, as kind of like stretching vibration, okay, uh, where you're going in between uh, two sort of states, 
right? You could look at uh, that interaction with the, um, you, you could think of the dipole moment also oscillating with this stretch, with this sort of, this uh, sort of movement between your two atoms, right? So let's think back about how dipole moments work. So remember, your dipole moment, represented with the Greek letter mu, is a, it comes about by taking the uh, partial charges, right? So you're dealing with the uh, charge E uh, times the distance between your two atoms, right? So in other words, this uh, magnetic field is going to fluctuate as the distance between the two atoms increases and decreases, right? So as the atoms get further away from each other, as you stretch out that bond, uh, you're going to uh, increase that that dipole moment, and then you're going to have them, uh, and you also have it uh, decrease as they get closer together, as that bond squeezes closer. All right. So what happens then is you have an electrical field that gets created by this oscillating dipole moment. Okay. Now, what affects that field, of course, then is how polar that bond is, right? The more, the, the greater your dipole moment, the greater that oscillation and the greater the induced electrical field, right? So in other words, the greater your, your bond polarity, the stronger that IR signal, because the greater that electric uh, field that gets created and therefore its interaction with the IR radiation. Okay, so in a nutshell, the more polar your bond, the stronger your signal. That's really what it comes down to. Okay, so you can see here we have this very polar carbonyl and that shows, uh, you know, we have that very electronegative oxygen compared to the not very electronegative carbon. And you can see that we have this very deep, strong signal. Whereas here we have this relatively non-polar carbon-carbon uh, double bond, right? And carbons have the same electronegativity. Okay, so we have a relatively weak signal. Now, the fact that a signal shows up at all tends, tells you that there is some polarity there, okay? So, so it, it kind of depends on what's, what uh, groups we have attached to these four bonds. Clearly, they're not the same. Um, if you do have a completely symmetrical molecule, it's completely nonpolar, well, then you're going to have a dipole moment of zero, which then means that there's no electrical field and there's therefore no interaction uh, with your infrared radiation, and you actually don't see a signal. All right. So normally you would expect a uh, carbon or a carbon carbon double bond uh, to show up somewhere in this range, right, between 1600 and 1700. But if we were, had a completely nonpolar molecule, so try drawing out 2,3-dimethyl-2-butene. All right. It's going to be a. Oh, well, actually, I guess I could just draw it out to show you. Um, basically, if we have two butene, so one, two, three, four. Okay, and uh, so if we have a double uh, methyl group at the number two position, methyl group at the number three position, you can see that this molecule is completely nonpolar, right? And therefore, there won't be any signal at all from that carbon-carbon double bond. Now, you're probably saying to yourself, wait a minute. There are a lot of carbon-hydrogen bonds here. Those aren't very polar. Why do we get significant signals for those if you know nonpolar uh, stretches don't really show up very well? Well, there's kind of a combined effect here. It's it's kind of like how uh, you can get a even though like London dispersion forces are really weak forces uh, between nonpolar molecules, if you have enough electron density, if you have a large and squishy enough molecule, it'll have, uh, its, its molecules will form a solid, right? They'll have a high enough melting point or boiling point, uh, you know, than you would expect for something that has only London dispersion forces. So, so this is kind of a similar concept that if you have a lot of carbon hydrogen bonds, which often is the case, uh, you will still get a decent signal, even though those bonds themselves are actually nonpolar. Finally, we come to signal shape. So basically, whether a signal is broad versus narrow, right? So uh, 
we've seen in an example with an alcohol group that we get a very broad peak for that. So why is it? What is it about that, that alcohol group that gives us that broad signal that we observe? Well, it comes down to the hydrogen bonding that we saw. So uh, the oxygen-hydrogen bond of our alcohol group is actually kind of stretched out uh, due to the hydrogen bonding uh, that occurs between uh, that hydrogen of that alcohol group with another alcohol. All right, so uh, basically that uh, the ability of that, um, you know, that, that sort of stretching out of that bond, that weakening of that bond because of the attraction of that hydrogen to another alcohol group uh, is what causes that, that broadening. Um, so you can actually play around with this uh, to sort of confirm the presence of one of these uh, sort of labile hydrogens. Uh, if you use a solvent that prevents hydrogen bonding, uh, you would see that this broad, what would normally be a broad peak would become very narrow. And there you would then know that uh, that would confirm that you are dealing with something that normally would have hydrogen bonding. So here's an example of that. So uh, while you normally would have this very broad OH peak here, uh, if you do have a sample of, uh, you know, an alcohol that, uh, you know, that doesn't have hydrogen bonding uh, mixed in there, or you've limited the amount of hydrogen bonding here, you'll see this narrow peak uh, from your OH groups that aren't uh, engaging in hydrogen bonding. Okay, now we've seen that broad peak from alcohol groups. Uh, another scenario that you often see in these IRs is a carboxylic acid. Now, in the case of a carboxylic acid, not only do you have that hydrogen bonding affecting that OH bond, uh, but also the resonance uh, with that carbonyl group. Uh, so this causes a really broad peak for that OH bond. All right, so, so you notice that we have a Instead of just that regular broad peak we would see for an alcohol group, we had this huge broad peak over here. Uh, and this is kind of a telltale sign uh, for carboxylic acids in general. So something to keep in mind uh, when you're trying to read a spectrum, if you see a huge peak like this that takes up like almost a third of your spectrum, uh, it's kind of uh, indicative that there's a carboxylic acid. All right. Uh, it, in addition to the... Uh, uh, the resonance, uh, the, the other reason that this is so pronounced is also uh, the way your two carboxylic acid molecules will dimerize. Uh, so it just kind of, you know, you kind of see an increased amount of hydrogen bonding that way. Okay, so uh, let's practice this. Go ahead and pause this video uh, and uh, see if you can predict the types of stretches you would observe for this molecule over here. All right, so if you've come back um, after having paused this video, hopefully you should have picked these up. Uh, so notice that we, we have a carboxylic acid group here. We have a carbon-carbon uh, double bond here, okay? Uh, and so think about uh, not only uh, just those functional groups, but also some of the hydrogens attached to those, right? So, so you've got to consider uh, that we have, a, you know, regular sp3 carbon hydrogen stretches, uh, but we also have carbon hydrogen bonds attached to these sp2 carbons, or rather just this sp2 carbon. Um, and so uh, keep in mind that that would show uh, up just above 3000 as opposed to below 3000. Okay. Uh, of course, I pointed out just now that, you know, this OH stretch is going to be really, really broad. Uh, don't forget, we also have our carbonyl stretch. Okay. That would show up there around 1700. Um, and I think that covers about everything, okay? But uh, again, if you were looking at this, I think uh, this OH stretch here would be really, uh, would kind of uh, really point out that you're dealing with a carboxylic acid, okay? But that being said, if you want to distinguish between multiple carboxylic acids, uh, you want to take into account all of these uh, peaks that would show up. All right. So another thing to consider when it comes to the, the number of stretches you see due to uh, in this region where you have an electronegative atom attached to a hydrogen uh, is the nitrogen hydrogen stretches that we see in primary and secondary amines. All right, so uh, this is another piece of information we can get here that's very useful uh, when trying to discern information out of IR spectra. Now, 
in the case of amines, of course, uh, why don't we see tertiary amines? Uh, remember, tertiary amines don't have any hydrogens attached to them, right? We have only three alkyl groups uh, attached to our nitrogen, so you wouldn't see an NH stretch. Now, how can we distinguish between a primary versus a secondary amine? Well, first of all, you, you know that it's going to be a, you know, you'd see a pretty a uh, strong signal uh, due to the electronegativity of that nitrogen causing you know that bond to be relatively polar. Now of course it won't be as polar or as strong as signal as an alcohol group uh, but still again you'd see a significant peak. Now how many peaks do you see? This is the key difference between a primary and secondary amine. So here's an example all right. Uh, again, uh, notice that uh, we it's not as, you know, if this was an alcohol group, it'd be much deeper, a much, a much stronger signal. But again, pretty significant here, right? Notice that here we have a primary amine, and we see two peaks at about the same, you know, uh, around the same wave numbers. And for our secondary amine, which has only one hydrogen, we have only one peak. Okay, so ask yourself, why is that? Now, the answer that's immediately coming to your mind is actually wrong. You're probably saying to yourself, well, obviously there's two hydrogens here. That's why we see two signals. Uh, that's actually not the reason why uh, you see two signals. It's because there are two types of stretches that we observe. So in the case of a primary amine with its two hydrogens, uh, you have a symmetric stretch where both of these hydrogens move in and out together all right, um, and you could have an asymmetric stretch where they alternate. So this one's coming in as this one's going out, and then as this one comes in, this one goes out. Okay, so both of those types of stretches give different signals. In the case of a secondary amine, which has only one hydrogen, um, you really don't have a difference between symmetric or asymmetric. There's only one hydrogen that's moving back and forth. Uh, and that's why you only see one signal for that one. Okay. Um, so yeah, so uh, this uh, phenomenon is also, you know, applies to other groups of, uh, you know, of hyd you know, bonds between hydrogen and other atoms. Uh, so for example, if you have methylene or methyl groups, uh, this effect also comes into play. Uh, that being said, since we're usually dealing with a lot of these carbon-hydrogen bonds, uh, typically it kind of gets lost in the shuffle. Um, so it's probably not as obvious as with a, um, a primary versus secondary amine, which has you know a pretty strong signal, a pretty broad signal, and therefore it's a little bit easier to observe. Um, that so something to keep in mind when you're trying to distinguish between two amines, all right? So if you have a um, you know a primary versus a secondary amine, look for that where that nitrogen hydrogen stretch should show up, you know, relatively to the left of your uh, of your spectrum, and look for one or two signals. And of course, if you don't see a signal there at all, even though you know your uh, molecule is an amine, uh, that might be a hint that you're actually dealing with a tertiary amine. Okay, so something to keep in mind when you're when you're looking for amines there. Okay, so let's summarize everything we've learned from that. Okay, so when you're looking at an IR spectrum, as I pointed out earlier, you want to focus on the diagnostic region. Uh, the fingerprint region, uh, it's usually just a huge mess of peaks. You're not going to get a lot of good, meaningful information there. So kind of focus more on the diagnostic region above 1,500 wave numbers. Okay, so remember, uh, break it down to sections, right? So you have a section for double bonds, you have a section for triple bonds, and then you have a section for uh, bonds of things to hydrogen, okay? Uh, of course, uh, bo other single bonds will be down in the fingerprint region where, you know, we can't really get a lot of good information out of that. But uh, for things bonded to hydrogen, those will show up way to the left uh, above 2700 wave numbers. Then once you've looked at those wave numbers, okay, and figure out which sections they belong to and help uh, that helps break them down. Uh, also, you know, consider the intensity of the peaks, right? So why are they, uh, are they strong signals? Are they relatively weak signals? And that tells you something about the polarity of the molecules, uh, or at least those bonds. And then of course, uh, look at the shape. Are they a broad uh, peak or a narrow peak? Okay, and again, that tells you something um, about the uh, potential for hydrogen bonding. 
Okay, so uh, let's have a, a look over here. So when we uh, look in that carbon hydrogen region here, um, you know, of course, uh, it might also help to have you know to mark that 3000 number there because uh, remember any peaks below that are hydrogens attached to a uh, sp3 hybridized carbon if you see any peaks just a little bit beyond that okay so between like you know somewhere around 3100 versus 3200 uh, again note that you're dealing with sp2 versus sp3 carbons again not the carbons themselves but specifically with hydrogens attached to them Okay, so if you have an SP, uh, if let's say you have an internal alkyne, uh, you're not going to see a peak here because there's no hydrogen attached to that SP hybridized carbon. Okay, um, and of course, once you get even further downfield, you have, uh, you know, like amines and alcohol groups. Okay, and, and of course, like I said, you'll, uh, the broadness of those peaks also tell you something. Okay, so I pointed out uh, earlier in this chapter that one of the key things for IR is to help identify functional groups. Now, why is that useful? Well, uh, oftentimes when we're doing uh, reactions, when we're carrying out multi-step syntheses, we're changing our functional group. Okay, so, uh, and running a quick IR might tell you a lot of information in that respect. So for example, let's say we are oxidizing this alcohol over here into the corresponding ketone. Well, running an IR would quickly tell you whether or not you made this product. Okay, so you know, again, think about the difference between that alcohol functional group and how it would show up versus that ketone functional group. Okay, so remember, this is a carbon oxygen double bond, so that'll show up in a set place in your spectrum. Uh, more importantly, that really broad peak that you would normally see all the way to the left for your alcohol group, that would disappear. Okay, so that would tell you that your reaction happened. Okay, your alcohol group was converted into something else. Okay, uh, go ahead and uh, pause this video for a second. And while you're doing that, uh, have a look at these different reactions and ask yourself, how could IR data help you uh, verify that the reaction happened? Okay, so if you've joined us back again, um, I don't actually have an answer site for this, so I'll just walk through each of these answers uh, together. So um, if we look at this one over here, um, notice that we have an alkene and it's moving, right? So we don't have really any other functional groups. Uh, so the functional groups themselves haven't changed. So what are we looking for that's different? What peaks might appear or disappear? Well, what's attached to that alkene? Well, remember, uh, we're looking, you know, like obviously both these will have carbon, carbon double bond stretches, so that might not tell us anything. But what other peaks might we see? Well, over here, we're going to have a carbon hydrogen stretch that will show up uh, above 3000 wave numbers because it's attached to an sp2 carbon. What about over here? Well, this uh, alkene is tetra substituted, so we don't have any hydrogens here. So that carbon hydrogen stretch above 3000 would disappear. Okay, and that would show that we've made this product. Okay, and then uh, what about this reaction here? Well, now we've gotten rid of this carbon-carbon double bond, uh, which, of course, would be a very weak signal. Notice that this is a relatively nonpolar molecule. Uh, instead, over here, we have carbon-oxygen double bonds. Uh, those would show up as a pretty strong signal, right, due to the polarity of that carbonyl. So, so that's uh, the difference there. We would see a strong signal uh, popping up in that carbonyl range. Okay. Now, again, this is a very uh, qualitative analysis. Uh, it just tells us the presence or absence of these functional groups. It doesn't tell us how much uh, of your, um, your product has been made. It won't tell you what your yield is, for example. Okay. You have to use some more quantitative methods uh, to figure that out. All right. So that's it for IR, for infrared. Uh, let's move on to mass spectrometry. Okay, mass spectrometry is also another one of those fundamental techniques that we use to characterize a material. So, uh, as the name suggests, it uh, tells us information about the mass of our substance, or rather, pieces of our molecule that we're dealing with. 
So what happens here is basically our sample is vaporized uh, and in the process it is ionized, it's converted into a positively charged ion that then gets attracted to a negative electrode near the detector. Now based on the mass of this ion, uh, it will get deflected a certain amount uh, as it makes its way to the detector. So uh, based on where it hits the detector, the machine will tell you how heavy that fragment is. Okay, so let's, let's look at that in a little bit more detail. So uh, the most common way to ionize these molecules is to bombard them with electrons. So you, you fire electrons at them and that in turn strips away electrons. Uh, so it causes your molecule to break apart into what's called a radical cation. In other words, you, you take away an electron, uh, now you have an unpaired electron, that's the radical part, uh, and because you've taken away a negative electron, the uh, what you have left behind from your molecule is now positively charged, and that's the cation part. Okay, so now you've taken away an electron from your original molecule. Now, electrons are very light, right? They're kind of insignificant when it comes to, to the mass of uh, the overall mass you're dealing with, right? Their uh, protons and neutrons are about one atomic mass unit. Uh, electrons are kind of next to negligible there. So if we've taken away an electron, what's left behind is basically still the mass of your original molecule, okay? Uh, if this this radical cation is relatively intact here. We call this a parent ion. So in in other words, uh, when if this fragment, uh, this pretty much intact fragment, uh, hits the detector, uh, that mass is effectively the mass of your original molecule. So so looking for this parent ion in your data is usually very helpful. Now that being said, oftentimes your molecule will fragment further. It'll break apart into smaller pieces. Uh, as your radical cation tries to become more stable, okay? So for example, uh, here we can have an electron from our radical transfer over to one atom, uh, and we can see that our radical cation breaks apart into a radical and a carbocation, right? So uh, now which of these will hit the detector? Well, your carbocation is what's going to make its way uh, towards the detector and um, you know because it's it's still charged and therefore it will not um, you know it'll it'll it's what's going to show up in your data okay the radical won't okay. so when we look at our data this is kind of what it looks like you'll see a bunch of peaks uh, on your x-axis you have what's called the m to z ratio in other words the mass per charge, per unit charge of your fragments, okay? Um, on the y-axis, you have what's called the relative abundance. In other words, how many of these particles are hitting your detector, all right? So that tells you how common are these fragments. So typically, the largest, heaviest peak, uh, so towards the right of your, of your graph, uh, that's usually your parent ion. And so that kind of tells you what you are uh, you know, what was your original molecule basically, right? Uh, and we, we represent this uh, with the symbol M uh, plus dot. Um, again, remember, this is a uh, radical or a radical cation, right? Hence the uh, radical symbol, that dot over there for the unpaired electron. And the cation is represented, of course, with a positive charge. Okay, and we, call that, we use a capital M to represent that parent uh, molecule. So, uh, that is our parent ion peak, and again, uh, notice that here for for methane, uh, it's at 16, um, you know, m slash z, uh, which makes sense that a molecule of methane weighs 16 uh, atomic mass units. Now, you're probably wondering, what about that peak over here that's at 17 atomic mass units? Uh, that's not going to be the parent ion. That's the uh, m plus one peak. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later. Okay, we'll get into that in a little bit. Okay, let's talk a little bit about fragmentation. So you probably noticed that there were peaks below 16 in that graph I just had for uh, for methane. So why is that? Well, that's where that fragmentation comes in. So if you have your uh, parent ion, right, that radical cation here, uh, and in the process we lose a hydrogen radical, well, that result resulting uh, methyl carbocation uh, gives us that peak that we saw at 15. 
Uh, likewise, you can keep on fragmenting off hydrogens, and we will see peaks at, you know, accordingly at 12, 13, and 14. Uh, at 12, we're dealing with just a carbon atom, okay, rather a positively charged carbon atom. Okay, so that's where we kind of get into that. Um, I, I pointed out that mass spec is kind of a very common uh, analytical method. It's, uh, it's a, uh, you know, it's a, one of the key things we use for characterizing a molecule that we've made. Um, so if any of you go into research, especially if you go into like synthetic organic chemistry, uh, if you ever make a molecule, um, you know, something that's relatively original, part of documenting it is getting just this fundamental uh, data about it, including things like mass spec, uh, you know, IR, NMR, all of this stuff, uh, just to help, you know, analyze it or to catalog it. Okay, so what, uh, how do we read the data from our mass spec? Okay, uh, as I pointed out earlier, that parent ion peak is kind of really important, right? It kind of gives you an idea of what is your uh, original molecule that's not fragmented, which is kind of what you really want to get out of this. Uh, though, of course, uh, a little bit of information about how that molecule fragments uh, can tell you a little bit about uh, the pieces that make up the molecule, in other words, its shape, its structure. Uh, though, of course, you're you're kind of limited here there um, in, in that kind of analysis. Uh, typically, you want to use something like NMR to do that, but you can still get some information out of mass spec. Okay. Uh, anywho, so here we have uh, benzene, a uh, molecule that doesn't really easily fragment. Uh, so you can see that we have, like, in terms of all of our fragment peaks, they're relatively short. But this parent ion peak over here at 78 uh, tells us that, well, that makes sense. It corresponds to the molar mass of our benzene. Okay, now here we have uh, hexane, right? Or, or sorry, pentane. Um, and you can see that uh, we have a lot of fragmentation. In fact, the most abundant peak over here is somewhere in the middle. Though that's not our parent ion. Our parent ion peak is down here at 72. Okay, which again, that 72 tells us that uh, we have, you know, that's the mass of your full molecule. Uh, that being said, we can still get some useful information here, right? If we look at the uh, higher peaks as we move down into these little clusters, uh, you'll notice that they correspond to the loss of, let's say, a methyl group or an ethyl group and so on. Okay, so basically, uh, like I said, the, the key thing you want to start off with is looking for your parent ion peak, right? Look for that highest value significant peak, and that tells you essentially the molar mass of your compound, okay? Now, there are other pieces of information you could glean from this. Uh, for example, if you have an odd number, uh, it could potentially tell you that you have an odd number of nitrogen atoms. Uh, where an even uh, number might tell you that you have an even number of nitrogen atoms, even no nitrogen atoms. That's not an amine at all. Uh, so uh, again, that's just a, a potential piece of information you might have. Uh, in case you're wondering about that, uh, that's because uh, your nitrogen has, uh, you know, typically will have three bonds and a lone pair on it, uh, which is an odd number. Uh, and as opposed to carbons, which tend to have even numbers of bonds connected to them, uh, or oxygens for that matter, which also have an even number of bonds. Uh, so the presence of an odd number uh, kind of gives away that you're dealing with a nitrogen. Okay. So I mentioned earlier that you sometimes have peaks that are beyond your parent ion peak, which on the face of it, it sounds really confusing, right? Why, uh, if your parent ion represents the whole molecule, how are you adding something to your molecule, right? Uh, to get that M plus one peak, for example. Well, it's not that you're really uh, adding anything, uh, but you have to keep in mind that you're not dealing with average atomic masses here. You're dealing with regular atoms, uh, things with protons and neutrons in in just integers, right? You've got whole numbers you're dealing with here. Um, so now we've got to take into account isotopes, right? So 
Uh, while carbon-12 is the most common isotope of carbon, and therefore accounts for the parent ion PQC, uh, don't forget there are heavier isotopes of carbon out there. You have carbon-13, carbon-14, okay, out of which carbon-13 is significant enough that you will see uh, a tiny peak uh, based on the presence of carbon-13. You just are going to have some uh, molecules in your sample that have a carbon 13 instead of a carbon 12. Okay, and that's where that peak comes from. All right, so, so whenever you see a, uh, a peak beyond your parent ion, that's usually due to your uh, to isotope effects. Okay, now the more carbons you have, the more likely you're going to come across carbon 13s. Uh, carbon 13s make about 1% uh, of all the carbon you're dealing with. So as you increase the number of carbons, you increase the probability uh, that there are going to be carbon 13s present. Okay, so uh, that's why uh, if we have a larger molecule like decane, which has 10 carbons, notice that our m plus 1 peak is much more significant than if we go back here. You can see how small that that peak is for methane, which has only one carbon. Okay, so so that's something to keep in mind when you uh, uh, when you're trying to l analyze that m plus one peak. Okay, uh, again though, it's this is only possible because that carbon thirteen makes up one percent of carbon. Now that doesn't sound like a large number, but when we're dealing with isotopes here, that's still significant. Okay, so something like uh, you know the hydrogens that we deal with. Um, are going to be mostly hydrogen one, uh, but you don't really see uh, m plus one peaks for hydrogen two or hydrogen three because their percentages are so low. All right. Now that being said, there are other isotope effects you want to keep in mind, and those also give away some telltale signs. Uh, for molecules you're dealing with, or at least atoms within your molecules. So, for example, chlorine has a very interesting isotopic ratio. Uh, chlorine is mostly made up of chlorine-35 and chlorine-37, uh, out of which about three quarters of it is chlorine-35, and the remaining quarter is chlorine-37. So you will see a, uh, a one to three ratio peak that are two uh, numbers apart from each other, right? So basically, uh, that if you see a, a set of peaks that look like this, uh, that kind of gives away that there's a chlorine present in your molecule. Likewise, bromine has two major isotopes, bromine-79 and bromine-81, uh, and they're about a 50-50 split. Um, and so if you see two peaks that are relatively even, uh, that are, just are again, two numbers apart, uh, that usually is a telltale sign that you are dealing with a molecule that has a bromine in it. Okay, so, so again, when you're looking at your mass spec, uh, you know, keep an eye out for, you know, when you're looking at that cluster of peaks near your parent ion, uh, keep in mind the, uh, the shape or the um, grouping together of peaks like that. Now, I mentioned earlier that when you have your molecule splitting apart into fragments, uh, you can kind of tell, uh, you know, a little bit of information of the pieces making up that original molecule when you look at the clusters of fragments. Okay, so uh, typically when you look at your clusters of peaks, uh, they, the difference between them accounts for the splitting off of things like methyl groups or ethyl groups or so on. Uh, so you can see that, for example, here. In this case, we have pentane, and we had different sets of peaks. And if we looked at this, the masses in between them, you could see that uh, after your parent ion, you might see a peak that is 15 um, numbers below your parent ion. Okay, and that accounts for the loss of a methyl group. Okay, likewise, you might see one that's 29 below your parent ion, and that accounts for the loss of an ethyl group that's being lost as a radical, and therefore doesn't show up uh, in the detector. Okay, so when you look at the actual graph, uh, you can see these sort of groupings of, of peaks likewise here. So, so here's that, that peak where you've got your, your fragment that has lost a methyl group, and here where it's lost an ethyl group, and so on. Um, you can tell from, from this that the group that's lost the uh, ethyl group is probably the most stable 
uh, out of all of those fragments. Okay. So, so typically that tells you a little bit about the stability of the fragments. Um, but again, like you know, sometimes it's a little hard to interpret. So, uh, while you can get some meaningful information here in the next chapter when we get to uh, NMR, not only can you get information about these fragments, but also how they're connected to each other. Uh, that's going to be some really useful information there. Um, now, why do certain fragments have different stabilities? This goes back to uh, the sort of electron donating effect uh, from our alkyl groups, right? So if you remember, uh, due to hyperconjugation, that's the overlap of those carbon-hydrogen bonds with the MTP orbital on your carbocation, you have uh, a certain stabilizing effect when your carbocation is near, has an alkyl group attached to it. So tertiary carbocations are more stable than secondary carbocations, which are more stable than primary carbocations, which are more stable than a methyl group. Okay, so in this case, if we can get a tertiary carbocation through fragmentation, uh, this would be your most abundant fragment that you'd see. Okay, and the fact that it is 43 below your parent ion tells you that there is a propyl group that's broken off here that was attached to that tertiary site. Okay, so uh, again, like, you know, that involves a little bit more analysis, um, and there are easier ways to do this, uh, but that is meaningful information you could get out of your mass spec. Other types of stable fragments uh, can come about through resonance. So uh, one thing you might see uh, pretty commonly in the case of alcohols uh, is the uh, is what's called alpha cleavage. So basically, if you break, uh, you know, so basically you have a, uh, a cleavage between your alpha and beta carbon. So here's your alcohol group. Yeah, alpha carbon is attached to it, the beta carbon is one carbon away from that. If you break that bond, uh, that radical unpaired electron comes down and forms a double bond here, uh, which you can see makes a resin stabilized uh, carbocation, which is what shows up on your detector. Okay, uh, So again, based on uh, what's missing, you can kind of figure out, well, what was at that beta carbon onwards, right? That's what broke off and you know doesn't show up at your detector. Okay, uh, other common uh, you know cleavage uh, sites include uh, alcohol groups breaking off uh, to form water. So basically, uh, if you have a hydrogen that's at that beta carbon, uh, you can basically lose a water molecule in the process, and uh, that water weighs uh, 18 atomic mass units. So that accounts for that difference there. Okay, so in addition to alcohols, amines also do alpha cleavage. So that's another uh, place that you might form a very stable fragment, okay, when you're dealing with an amine. Uh, carbonyls also can undergo a rearrangement uh, known as a uh, McLafferty rearrangement, uh, which makes a uh, very stable molecule, resin stabilized molecule here. Okay. So please note that uh, over here, uh, the cleavage occurs again between that alpha and beta carbon, uh, though you need to lose a hydrogen on your gamma carbon accordingly uh, for this to, to happen. Okay. All right. So in addition to just regular mass spec, it's possible to do what we call high resolution mass spec. Uh, so not only do we just see that M to Z ratio uh, but we actually go to more significant figures. We, we measure up to four decimal places, uh, and that really helps us nail down uh, the difference in isotopes there. Uh, that's because protons and neutrons, while they are both approximately one atomic mass unit, are not exactly one atomic mass unit. Uh, so once we get down to those kinds of differences, uh, down to four decimal places, we can really pick apart uh, the difference uh, between two different uh, fragments or two different parent ions. All right, uh, this gets really important when we're dealing with two potential molecules that we're trying to dis uh, distinguish between, and they have similar uh, atomic masses, okay, or sorry, molecular masses. All right, so it, it comes down to the the difference in uh, the atomic masses of the atoms making them up.
Uh, so for example here, here we have uh, cyclopentanone, uh, right, which is a ketone, and here we have uh, cyclohexane. Now, both of these have a molecular weight around 84 grams per mole, or 84 atomic mass units. Um, so if you looked at the parent ions for these with low res mass spec, uh, you would see parent ions about 84. Okay, and both these molecules uh, wouldn't really fragment very much. Uh, and if they did, they'd probably have similar types of fragments forming. So a low res mass spec doesn't tell you a lot. However, carbon and oxygens have different uh, masses once you get down to four decimal places. So you could really distinguish between your two uh, parent ions once you get down to that level. Okay. So yeah, so basically, uh, if we plug in the uh, molar mass, uh, the molecular weight of both these molecules down to uh, to four decimal places, you can see that our cyclopentanone uh, is 84.0573 atomic mass units, whereas our cyclohexane is 84.0936 atomic mass units. And, you know, so looking for that parent ion, uh, you'd be able to distinguish between those two. Another useful application of mass spec is actually in conjunction with another analytical technique, uh, one that you may have uh, may recall from last semester uh, from the lab uh, involving the dehydration of uh, 2-methyl cyclohexanol. Uh, if you recall, uh, when we do that elimination reaction, we get a mixture of two products. We get the 1-methyl cyclohexene and the 3-methyl cyclohexene. Uh, and we ran a GC, or gas chromatograph, on that mixture uh, to kind of see uh, the distribution of the two products, right? So, so if you go back through our labs from last semester, you might remember seeing a graph that had two peaks uh, with one peak bigger than the other to show which one was your major product, which one was your minor product. Um, a GC mass spec is basically uh, taking these two techniques and running them together. So, so up until now, we've been looking at mass specs uh, with just pure samples, right, with just one substance. Uh, but oftentimes when you have a mixture of substances, uh, it helps to separate them out using gas chromatography first. And then, of course, you can run a mass spec immediately on those. So uh, if you've ever seen an episode of Law and Order, uh, you've probably heard of this technique at some point. Uh, just, uh, you know, anytime they, they cut to the forensics department and, you know, the, whoever's working forensics down there is just like, oh, yeah, I ran that sample through the GC mass spec and it told me this, this, and this. Uh, it, this is the same uh, instrument that they're using. Okay, so, so essentially you run a GC first, uh, so it separates out your, uh, your sample into the components making it up. All right, so you, you get a gas chromatograph, uh, you know, spectrum that you, or um, a chromatogram rather, um, that looks like this, that has these different peaks uh, based on how uh, your different components of your mixture travel through the column of your GC. And then you run a mass uh, spec on that data accordingly. And so that tells you, gives you information about what each of those individual peaks corresponds to. Okay, so so in the case of law and order, in in the uh, in the forensics there, they um, when you have a mixture of, of a sample from a crime scene, it tells you what those uh, individual peaks correspond to. So between like how they move through the GC as well as the uh, mass of your parent ion, you could probably identify a particular material. Okay, so for example, if you, you know, you've got a, uh, an arson crime scene, you could detect an accelerant, you know, so for example, you could notice like trace amounts of gasoline, for example, uh, that tells you like, oh, this wasn't an accidental fire, this was, you know, uh, someone like, you know, dumped gasoline on this and they set the fire on purpose, for example. You know, uh, you might use it to look for particular drugs, for example, like, you know, um, and so if you have a sample such as like blood or urine, uh, you could look for key markers, um, you know, for whatever um, substance you're, you're looking for. Okay, now uh, another variation of mass spec uh, that you might come across is electrospray ionization or ESI. Uh, you, I mentioned uh, earlier when we talked about how mass spec uh, worked in general, uh, 
uh, I, I mentioned that we basically fire a beam of high energy electrons at our sample. It flakes off electrons, converts them into radical cations, and this is what makes its way through the detector. The problem with this is that you know, when you subject your sample to such harsh conditions, uh, you might degrade it. So, so in, in the case of certain uh, samples, uh, for example, certain proteins, you know, or large biomolecules in general, uh, you can damage your sample and therefore not get any meaningful information if you try to do that. Uh, so instead, you need to find a milder way to ionize your sample. And to do that, uh, we use what's called electrospray ionization. Okay, so essentially, uh, you take your uh, your sample, all right, your liquid sample, uh, and instead of ionizing it or, or um, you know vaporizing it using a lot of energy, uh, you put it into a vacuum, uh, and uh, that kind of uh, lowers the energy requirement to convert it into an ion spray. Okay, so basically, you uh, instead of firing a beam of electrons, you use a a high voltage needle in your uh, evacuated sample to convert it into a form that will make its way towards the detector. All right, so so that's it for mass spec and and IR. Uh, so we're going to close out this chapter with one more piece of information when it comes to analyzing uh, our uh, you know our sample or a compound and trying to figure out what it is right because that's kind of the goal here right we want to use these analytical techniques to figure out what we've got in our sample and you want you know oftentimes you need more than one approach to solve the puzzle all right so so you can have ir data that tells you what functional groups you're dealing with uh, you can use mass spec data that tells you what your uh you know your parent ion weighs uh, but in addition to that, it might be helpful if you do happen to have a molecular formula, uh, you can figure out the uh, presence of double bonds or rings by looking for degrees of unsaturation. Okay, so what do I mean by degrees of unsaturation? Uh, if you recall from last semester when we looked at the difference between alkanes versus alkenes versus alkynes, uh, this concept of uh, saturated versus unsaturated hydrocarbons came up. So uh, if you recall, alkanes are saturated hydrocarbons because they have the maximum number of hydrogens attached to their carbons. Uh, so uh, alkanes don't have any double or triple bonds, right? Because uh, that would imply that you could do a hydration or a hydrogenation reaction where you can add hydrogen across those double bonds and increase your number of hydrogens. Okay, so that's why alkenes and alkynes are known as unsaturated. There's room for extra hydrogens to go on there. So when we look at degrees of unsaturation, we're looking at how many extra hydrogens could we add to this molecule. And therefore, uh, by seeing the uh, room for hydrogens, uh, we can kind of figure out, well, how many double bonds are there? Or uh, how many places have we closed our chain of carbons into a ring? So to understand this, let's first look at that generic formula for an alkane. Uh, so for every carbon, we have double the number of hydrogens plus two, okay, plus two extra hydrogens. Now, where does that come from? Uh, let's, let's start off with a very simple example here. Let's look at propane, which has uh, three carbons, so let's draw those three carbons in a row here. Okay, now if you remember carbon wants to form four bonds, so if we look at that central carbon, it's got two of its bonds already taken up with bonds to the carbons on either side of it. So it needs just two more hydrogens to give it four bonds. Okay, so it's a little CH2 unit. Now, um, for the terminal carbons, okay, so if we look at this terminal carbon over here, it's only got one bond uh, taken up with a carbon, so it's going to need three more bonds to give it four bonds to help it meet the octet rule. Now, you could think of that as being a CH2 unit, just like this internal carbon, but we just have to add an extra hydrogen to help it meet the octet, okay? Uh, likewise, this carbon over here at the end is another CH2 with an extra hydrogen. Okay, so we've essentially added these two extra hydrogens to our two terminal carbons.
All right, uh, and so that's where that formula comes in, right? So uh, it's just a number of carbons. Uh, it, since you've got these CH2 units repeating, that's why you have double the number of hydrogens, but you have two extra hydrogens because you need uh, to cap off those terminal carbons with a hydrogen to help them meet the octet rule. Okay, uh, so whenever you uh, extend a carbon chain, all you're doing is you're adding CH2 units in the middle there. Uh, your, your terminal carbons still wind up being CH3s. Okay, and therefore this formula holds true. So for propane here, uh, you have three carbons. Three times two is six. Okay, so those are the six carbons here. Plus your two terminal carbons gives you eight. So that's why the formula of propane is C3H8. Okay, uh, if you were to try this out with butane, all right, with butane, you would have four carbons. Okay, well, that formula, if you double four, you get eight plus two, there's 10 hydrogens. Okay, so if you try drawing out butane, uh, you'd notice that the formula would still be C4H10. Okay, uh, we could try this out with pentane as well. All right, and actually drawing out pentane, uh, isomers of pentane, will give you a feel for why this, uh, you still have the same formula uh, for uh, the same pattern, even if you are dealing with a branched alkane. So for example, let's say we had uh, two methyl butane. All right, so I mentioned earlier that butane is, uh, is gonna be C4H10, right? So if I have four carbons, okay, so a regular butane, um, you know, I have, if I just add in each of these bonds, so I've got four carbons, so I've got four of those CH2 units, okay? Really, it's uh, just my internal ones are CH2s, but if I look at my two terminal ones at the end, uh, those are CH2s plus the two extra hydrogens, okay? So again, for following that, that formula, that's C4H, you know, four times two is eight, eight plus two is 10. And if you count this, you'll see there are 10 hydrogens, okay? Um, if, uh, let me just make a note of this here so that we have that when you're checking that out later. Okay, if we were to try to branch this out, uh, let's say we had uh, two methyl propane. Okay, so uh, for that, we would have a methyl group coming off that number two carbon here. Okay, so let's look at the number of hydrogens for a molecule like this. Okay, um, again, each of these carbons needs to have four bonds. So uh, we have, you know, Say we have two hydrogens here plus the third one to give that four. You know, again CH2 like that. There, and if we look at this methyl group over here, if we consider that as a CH2 group. It needs that another hydrogen here. Uh, now we've got three terminal hydrogens. But keep in mind that this internal carbon here, instead of being a CH2 unit, has one of its bonds taken up with that methyl group. So instead of having two hydrogens, it has only one hydrogen. Uh, that extra hydrogen goes to that branch, okay? So if you count the number of hydrogens in this, this formula is still C4H10, and it's still following that format where your number of carbons is doubled plus two, okay? Um, so go ahead and try this out with pentane, you know, give, give this a shot, like pause this video, and then on the next slide I have uh, a you know, just the uh, skeletal structures of different isomers of pentane, and you can verify that all of them are going to be C5H12, okay? So anytime you have a saturated hydrocarbon, that's going to be the case. Okay, so here are our different uh, isomers of pentane, and uh, I've drawn them as skeletal structures, but if you want to draw them as condensed structural formulas or even like regular Lewis structures, uh, you can confirm that they're going to have the formula C5H12. Okay, again, going off uh, that pattern where five doubled is 10, 10 plus two is 12, and that's the number of hydrogens you have for a saturated hydrocarbon. So, where we can figure out degrees of unsaturation comes in from where this formula deviates from that pattern. So pentane has the form of C5H12, but let's say we had five carbons, but fewer than 12 hydrogens. For example, here we have a double bond. Okay, we've got an alkene. Notice that in doing so, our formula drops down to C5H10. Okay, that double bond is a degree of, of unsaturation, or has a degree of unsaturation. 
Now, over here, the formula would be C5H8. Uh, that's because this triple bond, okay, which has two pi bonds in there, has two degrees of unsaturation. Okay. Now, there, when, once you start getting multiple degrees of unsaturation, you'll see that there are ways to play around with this. Um, in this case, we have a triple bond, but uh, you know it's possible to also have two double bonds. Uh, in both cases, you have two pi bonds, which would still give you that formula C5H8. All right, so you're kind of limited in how much information you can get out of this, but still, that's meaningful information. All right, now. Why don't you, uh, you try that out with something like cyclopentane? This gives you a good idea of how this also applies to ring compounds. Draw out cyclopentane and ask yourself, how, what's the formula going to be? And how does it deviate uh, from our uh, generic alkane formula here? Okay, so if you draw that out, you've probably noticed that, you know, if you draw cyclopentane, we've got five carbons in a ring, and each of them are CH2 units. So in other words, this formula is going to be C5H10. So notice that that's 10 and not 12. So closing a ring adds a degree of unsaturation. Okay, so if you had the formula C5H10, uh, it could imply that there's either a double bond in there or there is a ring in there. Okay, but not both. So that's something to keep in mind when you have the molecular formula for a molecule you're trying to figure out the uh, structural formula of. Okay, so let's let's have a look at an example here. Let's say we have C4H6. Well, if you've got four carbons, how many hydrogens would there be if it were saturated? Well, four times two is eight. Eight plus two is ten. So there should be ten hydrogens. But instead of ten hydrogens, there's only six. Okay, so you're four hydrogens short. Now remember, you add on two hydrogens uh, for let's say every double bond or every ring that you close. Uh, so there are two degrees of unsaturation. Now, what does that mean? Well, there's lots of possibilities. You could have two double bonds, you could have a triple bond, you could have two rings, or you could have a ring and a double bond. Okay, so there's lots of possibilities here. You're, you're kind of limited in how much information you get out of this, but it's still meaningful information. All right. Now, in addition to rings and pi bonds, there are other pieces of information uh, we can get uh, from, from other like heteroatoms. Okay, so uh, for example, if we have a halogen, because halogens like to form uh, a bond, just one bond, uh, just like hydrogen, uh, you can kind of swap out halogens uh, for hydrogens. So uh, in this case of chloroethane um, versus regular ethane, you can see that we still have uh, you know, six non-carbon atoms in our molecule. Okay, whether they're all hydrogens in the case of ethane versus five hydrogens and one chlorine in the case of chloroethane. Okay, uh, and notice this is this has no degrees of unsaturation. Then, if you treat uh, a chlorine as a hydrogen, okay, which again makes sense. There's no double bonds, no rings, nothing like that. So let's let's try that out. Here we have uh, a molecule C5H9Br. Okay, are there any degrees of unsaturation in that? Well treat that bromine as if it's a hydrogen. So instead of nine hydrogens, pretend we've got 10 hydrogens. How many hydrogens should we have if there are five carbons? Well, five times two is 10, 10 plus, uh, five times two is 10, 10 plus two is 12. There should have been 12 hydrogens or hydrogens and halogens if this were completely saturated. So the fact that there's only 10 of those tells you that there's one degree of unsaturation. Okay, so there's either a double bond or a ring somewhere in that molecule. Okay, um, another uh, uh, heteroatom that uh, doesn't affect your uh, HDI is your is oxygen. Uh, oxygen forms two bonds and has two lone pairs, uh, but basically you could kind of think of it as being inserted between uh, a carbon and a hydrogen. Okay, so uh, notice that. Uh, if we take the oxygen out, we still have six hydrogens, whether we have ethanol here, which has the oxygen inserted, versus ethane, which obviously is missing the oxygen. Okay, in both cases, we have 
six hydrogens. Okay. In the case of a nitrogen, uh, nitrogen increases your number of hydrogens by one. Okay, so uh, it, notice that without the nitrogen, uh, we have six hydrogens in our ethane. As soon as you turn this into ethylamine, notice that in order for that nitrogen to have three bonds, uh, you get an extra hydrogen, right? We have seven hydrogens in this molecule now. Okay, so that's something to keep in mind uh, if you have a nitrogen in your molecular formula. There, if you have um, a saturated uh, compound, it's going to have one more hydrogen than you would expect. Okay, so let's let's try that again with an example. Let's look at C5H8BrN and ask yourself how many degrees of unsaturation are there in this molecule? Okay, well, if there are five carbons there should be double that plus two. So 10 plus two is 12 hydrogens, out of which we've got eight hydrogens. Uh, we can treat that bromine as a ninth hydrogen. And keep in mind that the nitrogen means that you should have an extra hydrogen. So uh, instead of, uh, you know, a, instead of uh, 12 hydrogens, there should actually be 13, okay? So instead of 13 hydrogens, we have only nine, if we treat that bromine like a hydrogen, so we're off by four. So that tells us that there are two degrees of unsaturation. Okay, so instead of four, uh, we're missing four hydrogens, so to speak, uh, that would have given us the right number. And therefore, there must be either two pi bonds or a pi bond and a ring somewhere in our molecule, okay, for that to work out. Okay, so that's how you would work through it uh, kind of in a step-by-step -step format. Uh, if you'd like, you could also just uh, memorize this formula. Basically, uh, using this formula, you can figure out your your uh, your degrees of uh, of unsaturation by taking your number of carbons and doubling it, um, and adding two. Okay, and then you know taking you know uh, taking your number of nitrogens because remember that adds in the hydrogens you need. Uh, and then subtracting your numbers of hydrogens and uh, and halogens, okay, and uh, whatever difference there is, uh, you know, t divide that by two, okay. So if there's no difference, then that tells you that you have a completely saturated hydrocarbon, okay. But as soon as you start noticing there's an imbalance between your numbers of hydrogens and halogens versus the number that uh, that you're expecting, um, divide that by two, all right? Because remember, there's two hydrogens for every degree of unsaturation, and that tells you how many degrees of unsaturation there are. Okay, so again, like um, there, if you have lots of degrees of unsaturation, you're kind of limited in how much, uh, how useful that can be because there's, you know, a lot of variation for possible results there. Uh, but again, sometimes that can be useful uh, especially if you, for example, have a uh, index of, of zero that tells you there are no rings, there's no double bonds, no triple bonds, or anything like that. Okay, so let's uh, practice this. Uh, let's uh, look at, uh, let's kind of combine uh, multiple uh, analytical methods here. So we have a formula of C7H12O, and we also are told that uh, the IR for this molecule has a peak at 1687 wave numbers, and it also points out there are no IR peaks above 3000 wave numbers. Okay, so uh, first of all, figure out how many degrees of unsaturation there are here, and then think about what these two pieces of information tell us about how the pieces of this molecule are connected together. Okay, so feel free to pause this video while you think about that. Okay, so first of all, let's figure out the degrees of unsaturation. Uh, remember, oxygen has no effect on the degrees of unsaturation, so we can just look at our seven carbons and ask ourselves, are 12 hydrogens enough to saturate those seven carbons? Uh, and the answer is no, right? Because seven times two is 14. Uh, 14 plus two is uh, 16. So there should have been 16 hydrogens if this were a saturated uh, molecule, but instead there is only 12, which means we're four hydrogens short which means there are two degrees of unsaturation, okay? So this could mean a ring, this could mean, uh, or a, you know, some combination of a ring or a pi bond, or, you know, in fact, two pi bonds. 
Okay, so we have two degrees of unsaturation we've got to account for. What information does our IR tell us? This actually helps us narrow down our possibilities, right? Um, if we look at this uh, first uh, piece of information from our IR, it actually does tell us that uh, out of our all those possibilities for two degrees of unsaturation, there's really only one thing that matches. Um, if you recall, a carbonyl stretch shows up somewhere around uh, 1700 wave numbers, right? Maybe a little bit more. Like a regular ketone should be like around, I don't know, 1720, somewhere in that ballpark. Uh, but if we have a conjugated ketone, uh, that wave number drops to somewhere in that 1680 region uh, due to that Part increased partial single bond character of that carbonyl. Okay, so so the fact that we have a strong peak here at uh, in that ballpark, uh, the strong part tells you it's a polar bond. Okay, so that tells you, you know, that carbon and oxygen must have a double bond. Okay, uh, and that accounts for one of our degrees of unsaturation. But the fact that it's not uh, above 1700, it's below 1700, tells us that there must be a conjugated pi bond next to it. So we have a pi bond that is, uh, you know, two bonds away from our carbonyl. Okay, so in other words, we know that if we have our ketone here, we have a double bond next to it. Okay, so that's what this tells us. What else do we know? Well, the second piece of information from our, our, our IR tells us that there are no uh, IR peaks above 3000. So. Uh, remember, that 3000 ballpark tells you about uh, carbon-hydrogen stretches that have, that have your hydrogen attached to either um, sp3, sp2, or sp-hybridized carbons. If your carbon-hydrogen stretches are uh, below 3000, that means it's attached to an sp3 carbon. If it's above 3000, it's attached to a sp2 or sp-hybridized carbon. Now look at our alkene, right? Those two carbons are sp2 hybridized. So the fact that there are no peaks above 3000 tells you that there must be no hydrogens attached to those. Those must have only carbons. So let's draw in carbons there. So there and there and there. And let's figure out now what do we have for our um, you know, for our number of carbons. Are we meeting, have we accounted for everything? Oh, and don't forget this carbonyl over here, because that's an sp2 hybridized carbon as well, so there can't be a, a hydrogen here, otherwise that would also show up. So let's put a carbon there as well. So that gives us one, two, three, four, five, six, seven carbons. So we've accounted for the seven carbons in our formula. Okay, uh, We've got our two degrees of unsaturation. Uh, if we count our number of hydrogens here, you should see that we have 12 hydrogens. Okay, uh, So it's three, three, three and three here. So those all those methyl groups add up to 12 hydrogens. Uh, and that should be our, our molecule. Okay, so, so even though we had relatively little information here, it's enough to kind of piece together uh, something as complex as this molecule over here. All right, so that's kind of what it comes down to. You're, you're given clues and you're solving a puzzle. So this can be kind of uh, one of those uh, you know, for those of you who like solving puzzles, this is kind of the more fun uh, aspects of organic chemistry. And that's it for this chapter. Uh, so again, we're going to use the next couple of chapters in addition to this one to get more uh, more tools that we're going to add to our analytical toolkit that we're going to use uh, to help uh, piece together puzzles and solve them to figure out what a, an unknown molecule might be. All right, uh, but uh, for now let's uh, go through a couple of practice problems here. So explain why a completely nonpolar bond will not give a stretching signal in the IR spectra, and would you expect to see a signal for a carbon hydrogen stretch in a nonpolar molecule? Um, so to think back to signal strengths, uh, you've got to go back to that section where we talk about that. But remember, it comes down to dipole moments. Uh, if a bond is completely nonpolar, uh, it doesn't show up, right? There's no dipole moment and therefore there's no signal that arises from that. Now that being said, is a individual bond within a nonpolar molecule polar enough then to give rise to a signal? 
Okay, that's what it comes down to. You can have a molecule that is nonpolar, but if the bonds themselves are polar, they will have a dipole moment and they will give a signal. Okay, so now in the case of a carbon hydrogen stretch, uh, I think that would be polar enough to give rise to the signal. Okay, so it might not be a very strong signal. Um, again, if, if you have lots of carbon hydrogen stretches, they may add up, uh, but uh, this could be, you know, uh, you know, it kind of depends, but basically it should be polar enough to give you a signal. Okay, uh, explain how IR might be used to qualitatively determine the degree of substitution when ammonia is treated with excess uh, bromoethane. Uh, so by degree of substitution, so if you have ammonia, which is NH3, you're swapping out those hydrogens with uh, with bromines, right? Uh, or sorry, with uh, with ethyl groups, um, and you you're going to basically produce uh, an ethyl amine plus uh, HBr. Okay, and for every equivalent of bromoethane you add on, you're swapping out another hydrogen for an ethyl group. Well, so in other words, you're going from ammonia, which is NH3, to ethylamine, right, which is a primary amine, so there's two hydrogens on that nitrogen, to diethylamine, which is a secondary amine, which means it only has one hydrogen, and then finally you get triethylamine, which has no hydrogens on that nitrogen. It's a tertiary amine. Okay, now think back to where we looked at uh, the types of stretches we'd expect to see for an amine. So, of course, those that nitrogen hydrogen bonds are pretty polar. They show up uh, way to the left of your IR spectrum. Okay, they're going to be uh, a little broad because they're capable of hydrogen bonding. But more importantly, the number of stretches tells us the type of amine we're dealing with because we have different types of stretches. Okay, so if you have a primary amine which has two hydrogens, we would see two signals. We would see a, uh, a symmetrical versus an asymmetrical stretch. Okay, if you have a secondary amine, there's only one hydrogen, which means you'd only see one type of stretch, just that hydrogen going in and out. And then finally, if you have a tertiary amine, there would be no uh, peak in that region because there's no nitrogen hydrogen bonds to see. Okay, uh, and I guess I kind of stop at a tertiary amine. The question goes on to talk about quaternary ammonium salts. Um, if in that case again, you still have the same problem. There's no hydrogens on your nitrogen, and uh, therefore that signal does not show up. Okay, um, how would you use GCMS to distinguish between uh, constitutional isomers? Um, well, it this is kind of a broad question, uh, but basically. Uh, you know, typically you have different, uh, you know, different uh, uh, boiling points and different physical properties uh, like polarity and so on. Um, so the GC part of that would help uh, distinguish that just because uh, based on the difference in polarity or boiling point, uh, they would move through the column at different speeds. So, you know, they would show up uh, as different peaks on your GC data. Uh, that being said, uh, based on the fragmentation pattern of your mass spec, you could also try and piece together like, you know, how those fragments, um, you know, are different. Uh, this is assuming, of course, that uh, you are going to have different fragments. I, it's possible to have two constitutional isomers that have similar fragments. They just arrange differently. Um, so again, you know, uh, it, this is kind of a broad question. So. Okay, explain how an experiment involving isotopic labeling might be useful to explore the type of fragmentation that occurs in the mass uh, spec analysis. Um, again, like, you know, it depends on uh, the type of fragments you get, but uh, if you're using a specific isotope and you're enriching your sample with that isotope, uh, you want to look for that cluster of fragments where that isotope peak will show up. Okay, so for example, let's say you're using oxygen 18, uh, you'd see a peak that would be an M plus 2 peak, right? Um, depending on where it shows up, uh, you can kind of figure out, uh, you know, where that, what fragment has that oxygen. Um, you could also look for that, uh, that oxygen to be missing. Keep in mind, it could be in the radical part of your uh, fragmentation that doesn't show up at the detector. So instead of looking for uh, a peak that has two, uh, you know, two mass numbers 
this tube mass number is higher, uh, you might be looking for a drop in, you know, 18 uh, atomic mass units. Okay, so here's an example of where they've done that. You've got two places to put that uh, that isotope of oxygen, and so based on the location of the oxygen, you get different uh, fragments, right? So you can get, uh, you know, a fragment that's you know 31 versus 95, or you get a 33 versus 93, uh, and so doing that, uh, changing that location of that oxygen. Uh, can help you figure out uh, or at least confirm where that it's fragmenting at this bond over here okay um, all right so these practice problems have all been uh, you know a little bit more uh, sort of theoretical just helping you understand the uh, the concepts behind what we've learned to, uh, today in order to get ready for a quiz or exam uh, I recommend to try out the practice problems I've listed over on Blackboard. Um, so typically on a quiz or exam, the way you'll, you'll see these types of problems laid out is you will actually have to sort of practice the concepts or, or apply the concepts rather. Um, so for example, you might be given a, an IR or a mass spec and your answer choices will be potential molecules that fit that data or vice versa. You might have uh, a molecule or molecular formula given to you and you need to determine uh, what peaks you might expect in an IR or mass spec. Okay? And those would be the answer choices given to you. So, so I think that would be a little bit more practical for you guys to get ready for a quiz or exam rather than these uh, additional practice problems that were in this PowerPoint. Okay, so uh, be sure to check those out uh, over on Blackboard of the list of homework problems or suggested homework problems. Uh, and of course, don't forget the uh, solutions manual is available in the bookstore, uh, sorry, in the library under the reference desk. And I've also uploaded digitized copies of the solutions manual uh, to Blackboard uh, so that you can even uh, check that out even from home uh, to check your work. And as always, if you run into any problems, just let me know. All right, thanks, and uh, good luck on your quiz.